I think of uh, music as what I call the highest calling. It's the highest calling because it touches everybody. It's the highest calling mm -hmm. when it's in the hands of John Coltrane. It's the highest calling because the first sense to develop in a human being is the sense of sound. So you sing to the mother's stomach, you know. And it's the highest calling because in the beginning was the word. Was it written or was it heard? Mm -hmm. Sound. So for me, music is, is the highest calling in life and in creativity. Good afternoon and welcome to the Ford Theater at the Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Daniel Lano and I am the director for the Haley Gallery. I am honored to introduce today's talk. We're pleased to be together for a conversation with acclaimed artist, American uh, sculptor, printmaker, Willie Cole, and to mark the opening of his latest exhibit, Lyrical Reconstructions in our Haley Gallery. Across a more than 30 year career, Willie Cole's contributions to American art and culture are monumental. From the creation of aesthetically beautiful artworks to the presentation of social injustices, he is a prolific creator and his art has been showcased in more than 50 solo exhibitions across the United States and abroad. He is represented in the permanent collections of the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, among dozens of other major institutions. Cole was, in a, was an artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the first artist recipient of the David C. Driscoll Prize in African American Art and Art History at the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. To moderate this discussion, we welcome Ann Collin Smith, the director of the Xavier University of Louisiana Art Gallery. She serves on the boards of the Association of Art Museum Curators and the New Orleans African American Museum. Smith's interests are far reaching and her work explores the evolving role of the curator, material culture, public art, visual culture, and the African diasporic continuity in artistic and cultural practices. Immediately following the artist talk, we invite you to join us at the opening reception of Lyrical Reconstructions in the Haley Gallery. To get our afternoon started, please welcome Willie Cole and Ann Collin Smith. Everyone, how are you? Good. <laughs> Willie Cole, everybody. Thank you. So it's great to be in conversation with you. The first time I encountered your work, I was working at the Davis Museum at Wellesley, mm -hmm. and we bought Band Spirit Mask. Oh, popular so, one. Yeah, it's an amazing piece, and I wrote about it, and I have to find that okay. that piece of writing. So, what was the first object you created? Oh, you know, it's been a long life so far. <laughs> when you say first object, I go back to my days of uh, making forts with my G.I. Joes in the bedroom. The my mom American allowed me to bring like wood chips and dirt into my room and I made a big fort. Okay. Yeah. Do you make forts now? You know, I've been planning to make a castle out of water bottles. Okay. But I haven't done it yet. Okay. So speaking of water bottles, how are you working with water bottles now, and why are you working with water bottles? All right. Well, um, I had an opportunity to show at a museum in New Jersey, and uh, it's a big outdoor sculpture park. So I said, man, they're going to have a big budget. I can make anything I want. I get to the meeting. There's no budget. <laughs> and I was drinking water during the meeting. And just, I guess, maybe nervousness, I'm squeezing a bottle because the water bottles have all these uh, lines in them because they're made to crush to take up less space in the landfill. And I was able to make a fish out of the bottle during the meeting just by squeezing it, twisting it, and all that stuff. So that night, I dreamed about a chandelier made out of water bottles with a picture of Buddha in every chandelier. So I decided I would do it that way. I didn't know I was a recycler. I wasn't focused on the environment. But I'm, but I'm attracted to things I can collect in abundance, and water bottles are definitely that. Mm. So behind us are a rotating set of images of Willie's works. So, Willie, I'm gonna ask you to share a brief art history of your work and what media, media and materials you use, and maybe a couple of themes just to orient us to your work. 
Okay, well, you know, I, w I would say from, uh, from 1960 to 1967, mostly watercolors, uh, because I was very inspired by cartoons, and my dad made me a light table, and I had my own cartoon script that I thought I was gonna animate and all that stuff, but I never did, but I had all the equipment. I did all the drawings, I wrote all the stories. Um, and I was studying puppet making in the 60s at the Newark Museum, so I grew up in the city of Newark. I think by, by 1968, I was doing paintings, but I was using enamel paint, because I also built a lot of model cars and entered them in contests as a little boy. So that same little paint that comes in the jars, I used that to do paintings. And I did a lot of paintings on my grandmother's dog. <laughs> so, we're talk so we're talking about the 60s now. Um, in the 60s, I also did my first oil painting. I did what's called the Black Christ, whatever that means. But I did that for, uh, for my grandfather, who was a pastor. Uh, by the time I started high school, I was doing uh, mostly drawing and painting, but mostly still watercolors, I would say. Uh, in high school, I learned about acrylic, but mostly about tempera. We did a lot of landscapes on the streets of the neighborhood around the high school. It was a high school just for art and music. Um, my last two years in high school, my major, I switched my major from graphic design to fashion design. In fact, I have fashions here in the audience now. Ty, if you stand up. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I was playing. <laughs> so my last two years of high school was fashion design was my major. And um, I got out of high school in 1972. And I was going to go to school for fashion. But in the 70s, it was not Alphabet City like it is now. The LGBTXYZ was not a popular thing. So my family convinced me not to go into fashion because of homosexuality. So I switched to graphic design and majored in graphic design and illustration at School of Visual Arts in New York. And in those years, from 72 to 76, it was mostly acrylic painting. And uh, yeah, I went to Boston U for one year in 75, and it was mostly oil painting. Keep going, got, still got 30 years to go or more. <laughs> okay. Let's take a break. So, okay. Okay. Huh. I um, listened to one of your many artist talks and you said, talked about you wanted, your work was impressionist at first. Yes, yes, so you picked that right where we left off. I would say <laughs> that after, I got out of school in 76 and worked as an illustrator in New York for a year without a lot of success. But then I got a, uh, a residency in a theater department at the University of Delaware. And when I was there, I started doing landscapes uh, and using pastels. And I, because I was very inspired by Hokusai, the woodblock artist from, uh, from Japan, and also very inspired by, uh, I think during those years, I also would commute to Philadelphia every Wednesday to see Lust for Life about uh, Vincent Van Gogh and Paul Gauguin. <laughs> yeah, um, who was in that film? So, oh, Kirk Douglas, Kirk Douglas and, and Anthony and, Quinn. Okay, and Quinn played Gauguin yeah. and Kirk Douglas. So that made me yeah. interested in, in that kind of movement, uh, impressionism uh, and post-impressionism. So my pastels look like that, especially I was inspired by Surratt, who did the paintings with dots, but I chose to do lines, like dashes rather than dots, and I did a lot of those in pastels during those years. And um, that was, that's the Impressionist answer. Okay. I was just very inspired by the Impressionists for those works. Okay. The fact that uh, limited color palette was big for me, because in my sculptures, also limited materials, so my whole mm -hmm. idea of limitations in production materials began when I was a two-dimensional artist. And I didn't start doing sculpture probably until maybe 1987. Okay. So is a limitation a limitation? No, a limitation is a kick in the butt mm -hmm. to pay close attention. Mm -hmm. Because if, you, if I wanted to make a portrait of you and I could use any material I wanted, it's easy. If I want to make an eyeball, say, so, well, I just got to go out and get a ball, get a ping pong ball, mm -hmm. or get a baseball, depending on the scale. 
But if I said, but I only can, I only can use shoes, it forces creativity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what I like about it. It really forces you to open your imagination. And of course, anytime you make a work of art, you gotta proceed with confidence because you have no guarantees that it's gonna turn out. So you are referred to, and maybe you name yourself, or we, um, describe yourself as a perceptual engineer. Yes. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I've had many different titles over the years. After being an illustrator, I thought of myself as an archaeological ethnographic Dadaist because I was very into uh, to, um, to, you know, the Dadaist artists, especially Marcel Duchamp. New descending a staircase. Yeah, and uh, archaeology was the fact that I was finding things in the streets of Newark. Mm -hmm. And um, ethnographic was just because those years I was studying Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. And he always compared cultural and religious aspects from all over the world. So that became the catalyst for my way of thinking about art production. Um, so after that, I became a high-tech primitive artist. I was using buildings from the construction trade that I would basically steal off construction sites and make, <laughs> make things out of that. And then I went from there uh, to being a perceptual engineer uh, perceptual engineer because I suddenly had an awareness mm -hmm. of, of these faculties of the human, human uh, mind. People talk about the higher faculties of human intelligence, and perception is one of them. So I read a book uh, called the, well, the first one was called Sub Subliminal Seduction. The second one was The Age of Manipulation. It was written by a guy named William Keyes, and he used the term perceptual engineer to describe what the advertising industry puts out for us to perceive. Mm -hmm. They create the way we see the world. Mm -hmm. so it's called perception engineering. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, I think that's what I'm doing. I'm gonna create new ways to see the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna veer left. Pardon? I'm gonna veer left. Every direction is good. <laughs> Impro <laughs> improvise. So in the ways in we perceive the world, what are your thoughts about artificial intelligence? and image making now, and I guess art making? Well, that is a big laugh. Artificial intelligence <laughs> is a very serious thing. And yeah. I heard somebody say that the advent of artificial intelligence will have a bigger impact in our world than a discovery of fire. So there's, I can't think of anything more extreme. Mm -hmm. And I think they said in about 30 years we'll experience that. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of talk about it now, so something could happen, I don't know, but right now, the artificial intelligence is not physical. There's terms they use, I don't recall those terms, but I heard something recently, so like, if you look at the TV and you see robots, that's artificial intelligence, but it's embodied. Mm. The artificial intelligence that we're dealing with now is not embodied. Okay. You know, it's, uh, it's whatever computer stuff is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And, once it becomes embodied, that's when all hell will break loose. All right. Mm. But in how it will affect the art world, depends on how far it goes. I mean, if, if, our, if our 49th president is a robot, you know, then that's gonna have a bigger effect on everything, not just the art world. Oh, yeah. But if it's just about people going to chat uh, GBT and putting in prompts to make sculptures and paintings, and that's going to fade away because there's nothing better than a handmade, and, handmade, and eventually, yeah. eventually that will be realized. Yeah. In fact, we realize it now, but marketeers may think it's different for a while. Yeah, touch is so intrinsic to our being. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, would you share with us some of the themes you examine in your work? Yes. Um, my my biggest theme is perception. Okay. You know, I don't plan out my art. I just get inspired by an object and I get a bunch of them and just play with it till things happen. And if I make more than one, it's because I'm still discovering things as I go, I'm learning as I go. Okay. Um, uh, I never wanted to be dogmatic mm -hmm. in my work, but I have had some things because I'm doing my, what I think of as my personal mythology and then suddenly something happens in the world that's so powerful that I say I gotta make something about that. You know? but mostly I'm dealing with my own sense of logic and, and perception in my work. Mm -hmm. People have labeled it and they say that I am uh, a recycler. I haven't gotten an award for recycling, <laughs> but I never really 
thought of myself that way, even though I understand it now. Uh, my water bottle work has now made me like the green artist, the environmental artist. So I get a lot of commissions to make things out of water bottles. But my use of the water bottle has to do with the reflection of the light on the plastic and the spiritual feeling you get when you see that. You know. But that's my perception. Some people, like I have a piece now in Fort Worth, Texas, 20,000 water bottles to make a body that is 30 feet tall. And for them, it's about recycling. For me, it's about challenging and exploring my idea of a single object of multiplication can become anything. You know, 50 chairs, hey, I could do something with 50 chairs, you know? Yeah. I mean, the chair is only a chair because you defined it as a chair. It's really other materials completely. And those materials are not really materials. They are atoms and molecules and things like that, you know? So I'm just playing with those, those kind of things. I think I'm more interested in spirituality and politics, mm -hmm. but living in the world here, politics comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, artists, you know, we can create icons and symbols to express things that people have a hard time talking about sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So. so that big piece in Fort Worth, Texas, how did you create that piece and who did you collaborate with? Ah. Well, there's a place called the Health Science Center. Mm -hmm. And then there's a place that I wish I knew is the Tarrant County something or other, but it's under the umbrella of the National Negro College Fund. Okay. So those three groups came together and they, they wanted me to make something uh, out of water bottles mm -hmm. because they were focused on the environment and they wanted uh, community involvement. And water bottles are community projects for me. So they got uh, put stands and containers all around the city for people to throw their water bottles in. And they collected about 30,000 water bottles. Uh, the next step, of course, is to wash the bottles and move the labels. But then they brought in school groups. Mm. And I mean, it was like, it was like I was in China with cheap labor. <laughs> these, these little kids spent days putting holes in the bottles, one the after the other. little hands, they, they help. And we yeah. put the holes in the bottles using a soldering iron because it goes faster. Because yeah. the bottle yeah. will collapse if you try to push it with a drill. Mm -hmm. So they did that. After that, the next step was to put the bottles on 12 foot long wires. So they doing that. So then we have all these long strands of bottles. And then I get to work. <laughs> I lay those strands side by side. Mm -hmm. I get a plain wire without bottles and I weave across them. So now I have a blanket made out of bottles, and I can cut it into any shape and make anything out of that. Um, so I try to keep the community involved as much as possible. Okay. And I've experienced that the fact that I do this a lot, nobody does it right. I end up doing it over again. But that's, <laughs> that's the way it goes. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, they, yeah. The putting holes in the bottles is helpful, putting my wires is helpful. Yes. But uh, the weaving, people get confused with the over under. Because they're saying it out loud, over, under, over, under. And then they forget if they're going vertical or horizontal over, under. So now it's all, and it's got to be perfect because the weaving keeps the form together so the bottle's not popping out of it, you know. You can't skip and do three overs and then an under. All right. So I want everyone to remember over, under, because we're going to sing that tonight. Just remember, and I'm going to start us off. So speaking of which, I am from New Orleans, and so music is very central to my being and to our being. So given where we are in this place, in this moment, what does music mean to you? And how did you start incorporating well, I, it to I your work? Of, I think of uh, music as what I call the highest calling. It's the highest calling because it touches everybody. It's the highest calling mm -hmm. when it's in the hands of John Coltrane. It's the highest calling because the first sense to develop in a human being is the sense of sound. So you sing to the mother's stomach, you know. And it's the highest calling because in the beginning was the word. Was it written or was it heard? Mm -hmm. Sound. So for me, music is, is the highest calling in life and in creativity. For me personally, you know, I. I mean, I grew up in the 60s, so music was everything and everywhere. It led us through racism. You know, it, it was just a beautiful thing. Before, music was all about boogieing and parties and booties and, 
and whores, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. It, it was about something, you know, it was about uh -huh. moving on up. It's, it's you know, it's, it was lyrics that really meant something, you know, going just all the way forward. I mean, Curtis Mayfield, Earth, Wind and Fire, even the Beatles, uh, they, all the words meant something that was special that affected our lives. Mm -hmm. So it's important to me for that reason. Um, so quite naturally, I wanted to try to play music. I think of all the, all the art forms are basically the same thing. Because uh, creativity is like a force in the universe. If you are aware of it and can access it, you can grow with it. So I've been uh, wanting and trying and pursuing the growth in music for, uh, well, I got a guitar when I was eight years old. When the Beatles first came to the US, I said, Daddy, I gotta get a guitar. And he went to the pawn shop and got me a guitar. But I'm left-handed, and because I'm left-handed, I was unable in 1963 to get anybody to mm -hmm. give me lessons. Mm -hmm. you know? And because I was a visual artist, it didn't dominate my interests. Mm -hmm. But I've always had one. Um, so, you know, I was telling uh, someone here that my greatest gig was playing in my daughter's bedroom every night for 14 years. Oh just playing uh, melodies of her favorite songs, or attempting to. <laughs> so, because I'm here in Nashville, you know, I just want to be able to say, yeah, I played in Nashville. So I don't, I don't know how good I'll be, what it'll sound like, you know, I'm, I'm basically a bedroom strummer. But Over, under, y'all, but go ahead. I need, <laughs> I need to get it out of my, out of my system. Yeah. So I said, I'm gonna give it a shot, you know. Awesome. Plus I saw Wayne do it at his opening. <laughs> That was the main inspiration. So how did you start using musical parts in your work? Uh, I, well, the first musical piece was the piano bird. Okay. And it's because the part of my house that is my studio now mm -hmm. used to be the great room and it had a piano in it. Now, once the kids were gone, and I was living there by myself. The piano took up too much space on that wall. I wanted to use that wall to make art. So I took it apart. Parts are too big and hard to throw away, so I made something out of it. So if I make something out of it, I have a second life and blah, blah, blah. Uh, maybe a, about two, two years later, maybe three years later, uh, my daughter-in-law called me and said that she had a friend who told her that Yamaha has a music program where they give uh, imperfect instruments to schools for kids to make, to paint on. Mm -hmm. So they'll give them a bunch of guitars and they'll do paintings on them. And she said, but when I told them that my father-in-law was an artist, they said they would give them to you. So they gave me 75 guitars. And I spent a year just playing with them, see what I would come up with. Um, so that, that was how the music instrument thing began. But maybe a year later, I get a commission in Kansas City for their new airport and for me, it was like reading an equation being Kansas City, Charlie Yard, Bird Parker, saxophones, and airport. Add all those things together. And what does it spell? It spells saxophone birds. So I made 12 birds out of saxophones for the airport. But my first prototype was made from 30 saxophones. I, I bought a bunch of toy saxophones to practice with. Um, but after working on the project with real horns, after maybe two months, I had a better design, which only involved 13 horns. So when the project was installed at the airport, I ended up with, uh, call me the garçon. Mm. I ended up with uh, like 160 horns left over. So I said, I'm gonna stay in Kansas City another year and, and play with these horns, because all the energy was in Kansas City for the whole project. I mean, I was in an amazing theater, probably eight times the size of this place, with a ceiling probably three times as high. It had been abandoned, but they gave it to me as a studio, so I just stayed there and continued working on birds with saxophones. There's one in the gallery now. Mm -hmm. And that's where it is, where it's at. Uh, now people are thinking that I'm an artist who makes art out of instruments. But to me, I am assigning objects to be particles or molecules or atoms. And if I had a, if I had a hundred of you, you know. <laughs> My dad wouldn't want or one anything. of those spells, but yeah. <laughs> you know, anything, it would just, it'd be the same process. 
It's, it's all about learning to look at an object and to let it talk to you, whatever it is. You mentioned Comme de Garçon. There is a lot of, it's like trendy for art and fashion to exist together, but it always has. Mm -hmm. So would you tell us, given that you wanted to study fashion design, but folks said no, how did you come to the collaboration with Comme de Garçon? Uh, during the pandemic, all the museums and galleries were closed. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, I, you know, I have this thing I, of what I call personal magic. So I was discovered on Instagram by Comme de Garçon. Mm. And that's, that's how it happened. Okay, what did it you It came right on time. Awesome. Okay. I did uh, props for the runway show in Tokyo. Okay. okay. And I did textile designs for all the clothing. Oh. And the hats out of high heel shoes that they sold in the store as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So, but from that, I ended up working with uh, two other designers up to this day. Okay. I am creating so many exhibitions in my mind. So, would you share with us what Miss Anita's wearing? <laughs> I wish I could do a Japanese accent, but. You know, Rea Kubakaba, who is the, is Como de Garçon, it's her company, she's a designer and all that. Mm -hmm. And Como de Garçon, I think it means where are the boys? Mm -hmm. So these clothes are, all her models are like little, little, small boys. Mm -hmm. You know, boys passing as small men, I guess, or small men passing as small boys. So the, the clothes become uh, almost asexual. Anybody, male or female, doesn't matter. Uh, but they all have strong, uh, to me, strong samurai or Japanese influence in design. As you see what she's wearing, how it has tails on the back. It's basically a bomber jacket Mm. But it has these added uh, layer of silk fabric that has the imprint of my work on it. Mm -hmm. Iron prints or? Uh, no, a shoe mask. Uh, oh, shoe okay. Mask, a yeah. shoe mask, wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. So my art is very popular in Japan for that reason. Okay. Awesome. So I have two more questions and we'll open it up to the audience if you have any questions and then we can jam over and under. <laughs> so you transformed the quotidian, so be it um, a high heel shoe, an iron, an iron impression, and a scorch, a water bottle, mm -hmm. um, a piece of a guitar, a saxophone, into these fantastical works. So in what ways have the arts, be they visual, the literary, performing, how have they transformed you? Uh, well, they clearly transformed my life. I'm sitting here in front of all these strangers feeling kind of relaxed. And I, they're interested in what I'm doing. So that's, you know, it's an it's a ego transformer for sure. Yeah, and building community. Building yeah. community. And also, you know, I am basically an introverted uh, hermit. I don't have a social life unless I'm on the road. When I'm home, I'm home alone, and I live in an environment where my neighbors are not accessible to me, like in the middle of the woods. Mm -hmm. So my art has brought me into the world. It's given me a voice, uh, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's been my full-time livelihood since the 80s. It's taught me a lot about faith. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just taught me so much, you know, it's like, think about my generation, you know, Sly Stone, you can make it if you try. All those things, they became very real for me as an artist. And I had to actually take myself through a lot of mental acrobatics because I grew up hearing, we like your work, we're so glad you're an artist, but you're not gonna make any money until you die. I grew up hearing that a lot. <laughs> so, so working against that, you know, required some, some exercise. Plus being African American too, you know. Like the New York art scene didn't show a lot of artists of color until after Basquiat died. I think of myself as a post-Basquiat artist, like the same way the Christians will say Jesus Christ died for our sins, 
I say Basquiat died for our careers. Because as soon as he died, every artist in Soho got one black artist. But you preceded Basquiat. No. Well, I was alive. Okay, before he was born, but. <laughs> I think he might be maybe four or five years younger than okay. me. Okay. But when Basquiat came on the scene, I was in theater pursuing a career as an actor as opposed to being a visual artist. Mm. University of Delaware Theater Department doing children's theater mm -hmm. in the tri-state area. Came back to New York to see Basquiat's show. You know, what did you think good. of his work? Well, you know, I have to give praise to anybody that takes the time and has the nerve to make a work of art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I personally feel, with so many things in life, we are engineered, perceptually engineered to see things as good, bad, mm -hmm. and indifferent. Mm -hmm. So we have been engineered to see mm -hmm. Basquiat as a great artist. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to me, Basquiat is uh, uh, du buffet, mm -hmm. very similar to du buffet. A little bit of Cy Twombly in there, mm -hmm. and a little bit of graffiti. Um, I, don't, I don't see it as and this is my own programming to say mm -hmm. that I don't see it as amazing as, say, Renoir. So what's in the recipe for your work? There is no recipe. Okay. Just, just, just faith. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And awareness, you know, is just say, stay alert, pay close attention. Yeah. There is no recipe. Thank you for saying that, because people think it's just this, 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 this. Yeah. No, no, I, I don't know what I'm doing from day to day when it comes to, yeah. to art production. Like, I'm really excited and curious to know what's next for me now. I just mm -hmm. finished that giant water bottle piece uh, last month in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. And I started uh, illustrating a children's story, because I still like to draw cartoons and things like that. But after that, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do next. But I know it's going to be fun. We know what you're doing in like in a half an hour, though. Uh, I know what the something. plan is. Okay. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> the assigned recipe. Yeah. But once the cooking starts, you don't know what's going to happen. You never know. <laughs> that alchemy. Right. So a little birdie told me that you are creating prints here. Yes. So could you give us a clue about those prints? And not to advertise, but if I were you, I'd get some of those prints. <laughs> well, I want it to be in the style of hat show prints. Okay. And I want to fit in thematically. Mm -hmm. So I found this painting in my studio that I did like in 1973 of a bluebird playing the guitar. And I use that as the foundation for my prints here, that same image. Awesome. How many prints are you creating? One or? Uh, two. Okay. Two. Okay. Plus they did a poster for the show as well. Okay. Wow. So someone is looking at their clock. Does anyone have any questions that you'd like to ask of Willie? I just want to say, I do these events for the questions because I don't want to hear him myself talking about myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, the advertisement of your art and this activity was a, it looked like a keyboard or something like that? Yes. Oh. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, that's a bird made from a, a grand piano. I use the legs and the keyboard to make that bird and the pedals. I kept the, I guess it's called the string board. I kept that almost like a musical fireplace for a few years because it was so big and hard to throw away. But I eventually got rid of it. And um, I kept some of the other wood parts just to have his wood shapes to play with. Yes, sir. Yes. And what, uh, uh, what, you, what objects you discovered or were drawn to first? Yeah, well, every question for me has so many answers. Um, in the mid 80s, my best friend was an art dealer. And like me, he was up all night long. And he sold African art. So in his loft, he had a lot of amazing art, most from West Africa. And I was a painter. You know? <laughs> So I was inspired by the forms that he had in his studio in art. But also that same year, I was taking a jewelry making class at the Newark Museum. And I recognized the jewelry was just little sculpture. 
So I started collecting small, rusty things on the street to make jewelry for myself to wear, mostly necklaces and things like that. And looking for little rusty washes on the street to make a necklace, I'm following, to, you know, walking down the street, looking down. I come to this abandoned factory building. I go up the steps, I'm in the factory building, and on the second floor, I find a mound of hair dryers. I mean, like thousands of hair dryers. And this building had been empty for many years, and some of these dryers were dirty, but they were all unused. And there were homeless people living in the building, and they all had shopping carts. So I got a shopping cart, and I began to unload those dryers and brought them all back to my studio. And that was uh, the first real sculpture, I would say. Other than school stuff, school was mostly clay and plaster casting. So that's, that's how I was. <laughs> as Richard Pryor, I think, says, and that's how I got the shape I'm in today. <laughs> okay. Yes. Ah, yes. Um, after Coma de Garçon, I worked with the Todd's. Todd uh, makes leather goods. Their most famous piece is called the Gamino Loafer, uh, Gamino Moccasin, rather. And it's a moccasin that has little dots on the bottom of the sole. Um, so in Milan, they have something called Salon de Mobile once a year. I think it's in September. But they're closed, the country's closed down in all of August. So I had like a week to make five works of art out of these shoes. And uh, it was a good experience. Um, it, led, it led other companies to send me their shoes. I recently received a big box of shoes from uh, some Brazilian loafer company. You know? So that's, uh, you know, to do something that doesn't involve an art dealer is always a great experience for me. <laughs> you know? Nothing against any dealers here, but you know, you want to be... <laughs> The feeling of independence is great. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Well, because of that four year difference in age, but also in, in recognition, I knew I was an artist as a little kid. And I got fired from my computer graphics job, probably like around 1983. I got unemployment hold for one year, and I decided in that one year I was going to make enough pennies to get my first dealer in New York. And I did that successfully. But when Jean-Michel Basquiat uh, came on the cover of New York Times Magazine, I knew that my dream was possible. So I would say he, mo he inspired my career. Uh, my work was inspired probably early on mostly by Marcel Duchamp, but I went to, uh, to the south of France in, I think, 19, maybe 86, and discovered a French artist named Armand Armand, and um, I think his, ins his uh, inspiration is very present in my work today. Can you tell us a little bit about his work and how it... Yes, Armand, he worked, with, he worked with single objects. Okay. He would just, uh, he didn't transform them, he just collected them. Mm -hmm. It became a trend for a while in New York called accumulation, <laughs> where you would get like 50 baseballs and put them in a frame together and say, hey, I made this, that kind of thing. <laughs> so Armand was kind of in that. I was also inspired by Carl Andre, mm -hmm. the minimalist. Just minimalism in general inspired me. Um, but Carl Andre would take construction materials, like he'll get 50 cinder blocks and just line them up perfectly down in the middle of the gallery. And I thought that was cool. It felt good. It looked good. So I was inspired by Carl Andre. Mm -hmm. But I was also inspired by uh, concepts of Tibetan Buddhism mm -hmm. and also kind of the aesthetic of Asian art in general. Mm -hmm. But um, I thought about how when I was a kid, uh, Carlos Santana had an album called Love, Devotion, and Surrender. <laughs> and in the inside, it was written by Sri Chimroy, who was his guru. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, you know, we see the ocean, 
but every drop of water is present in the ocean. We see the bigger picture, but it's all these little things that make it. So that got, and he tied it into a whole topic of, of oneness. So that became very big in my life to this very day. And speaking of the pointillism, you yes. know, yeah. you see a whole picture, but you just never really see the dots or the lines that make that yes. whole. And part of that may come from my, teach, my penny teacher in college was Chuck Close. I don't know if you know Chuck Close, America's, at that time, America's favorite portrait artist. And he would take a large canvas and divide it into squares, like grids. Then he's painting from a photograph, so the photograph's divided into grids too. But when he's doing his painting, he would work one square at a time. So mm. that came part of my inspiration as well. I think there was a follow-up question from, but not yet. Hey. Yeah, pretty much, but I find similarities. Like, everything I do with the shoe, I did it with the iron before the shoe. So the iron taught me how to see. But the shoe is much more flexible, so I was able to take it further with the shoe. Uh, with the saxophones, I said I made the piece out of toys first. But when I was in Kansas City, uh, they gave me a tour of the city. And I met this guy who has a musical instrument repair shop. And, and custom bill shops. So I hired him as, I hired him as my assistant. <coughs> and um, <coughs> between the two of us, we just figured out how to put these things together. Because when I did it with toys, I just used zip ties. <laughs> but uh, when we made the final pieces for the airport, there are no, there's no welding, there are no screws. It's just a puzzle, you know. It's like, you know that this piece fits in this piece just by the shape of it. Yeah. So that's it. I, I kind of, uh, you know, my major wasn't sculpture in school. Of course, in foundation year, you get sculpture. But beyond that, it was all illustration and graphic design. Uh, so it's just trying it, seeing what works. And I, I did have a summer stint in construction. So from that, building materials and tools, I learned from that. Yeah. And then I just pay attention to people. I ran a gallery in Newark for a few years, a nonprofit gallery because a friend of mine said, if you want to be an artist, you have to have a gallery. What she really meant, <laughs> you have to have a dealer. But I was too naive to know that, so I started a gallery. So the artist who I sh was showing my gallery, I would study their work, and that was helpful to me as well. They were all like, I'm just a BFA guy. These cats were all PhDs and MFAs, you know, and I would read their books as well. Yeah. So. Get just a little louder. How long does it usually take to make a piece of art? Well, if I'm lucky, it takes one day. <laughs> um, I want it to happen as quickly as possible because I don't want to think about it. You know? But I've had some things that take uh, three weeks. Um, it took me a year, two years, to make the 12 birds out of saxophones. Mm -hmm. uh, first to figure out how they would look with the toys, and then traveling to Kansas City to work on them. I didn't go every day. I went one week a month. And um, so it ranges like that. You know, When I worked at the shop in, in Milan with Todd's, I just had either seven or 10 days to make five works of art out of shoes. So stuff was made real quick, you know. I mean, a, maybe a day and a half for each object. Um, it was a moment where I proved to myself I'm still a young man. Because every night after work, I go back to my hotel, I was so sore, I didn't think I'd make it the next day. But I always did. So it, it varies. It could be, ideally, one day is great. You know, because you got that energy, and the first day is when you're really excited. After that, you know, it, it, you know, you can get distracted by another new project, which happens often, or you can commit to the one you're doing. 
So it varies from one day to, to one year. There's a question. Of That's the toy okay. model, first prototype. Oh, wow. Wow. Held together with zip ties. <laughs> There is a question in the back. Yes. You mentioned belief in personal magic. Can you talk about what that is? Yes. I would say this, this is a tough one for me to talk about um, in detail because everybody's different. But tuning your belief system in your favor as opposed to adapting your programming and letting it be your, your driver in your life. I, it's like um, deciding you're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. You're not going to try. You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. So things like that, you know, strong belief in yourself, uh, recognizing things like uh, time is not what it appears to be, that we have measures, but those measures are created mostly for the workforce, like daylight savings time and all that stuff for the workforce. Um, it's, it's really hard to explain, but it's just through practices like of, of meditation and, and self-awareness. Um, but mostly it's about, you know, you won't, you won't experience anything you don't believe in. So without any explanation, if you start to believe that there's magic in your life, you will eventually have magic in your life. And I have a lot of magic in my life. I've had things happen to me that surprised me 100%. You know, I, I mean, I've had the corniest things happen, like having no money and seeing a dollar floating down the street and chasing it. And when I get around the corner, there's a bunch of dollars floating, you know, because I believe I deserve it. You know, so things like that. It's, it's really it's hard to explain, but it is real. It's, it starts with your mind and your perception of yourself and your, and your own life. Mm. It's insane, I know, but. Yeah, <laughs> I read earlier today about time in itself as a recycling process. So it's not necessarily an hourglass mm. as people would like to think it is. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that um, touchstone in life because People tell you you have a certain time to do things. We yeah, have people, all the time in the world. People use time as a stressor. Yeah. Put time limits on stuff, give a certain amount of time to do stuff. And it's, our whole society is based on it, so we can't escape it in that way. Yeah. But we can recognize, like, if a day is 24 hours and you sleep eight hours, you can slide at eight anywhere along the line so you can do your thing when you feel the need to do it most, you know. But they got us on rhythms like, uh, you know, dinner time, lunch time, breakfast time, sleep time, wake time. It's just so many things that I'm into just being time, you know, just be, be, uh, recognizing the, the flow of, of nature and things like that, you know. Like I say to myself, my mom would say to me that heaven and hell is here on earth. It's just it's about what you want to look at. <laughs> So I've been telling myself since I was a teenager that I am not in hell, I'm in heaven. I was not put here to fail. Everything's gonna be fine. Even when it seems challenging, why would I be on earth to suffer, you know? Now I know, you know, no offense to anybody here, but I know that there's a, there's a couple of things in the world that tell you that you are a sinner and you're suffering and all this stuff. I let that stuff go a long time ago. And I just expect the best, even when it doesn't work out. You know, the experience was, was great. Yeah. yeah. So. There's one more, maybe two more questions. So the woman right there has been patient. Thank you. Oh, definitely, definitely so. One, another thing that led me to go from painting to sculpture was a toy called the Transformer, 
when my son got that transformer, his first transformer, I was sitting at the easel doing a painting, and he comes in the room and says, look, Dad, a gun. Look, Dad, a car. Look, Dad, a tiger. And it blew my mind. Yeah. And at that moment, I said, you know, I think I'm going to do it with my art. And it started with those hair dryers doing that. So, yeah. And Picasso said that's the way to go. You know, you want to, you want to see life as a child through the eyes of a child. So anybody who went to art school has heard that. You have to unlearn what you've been taught because all, all knowledge creates limitations except for the knowledge that knowledge creates limitations. You know? So. One more question and then Daniel. Right there. Will you tell us Okay. Okay. Well, with the guitars, I used a bandsaw because they gave me a lot of guitars, but they gave me a lot of those guitars that are like the smaller ones. I don't know if they call quarter size, half size. I had a bunch of those, and they fit under my bandsaw pretty easily. Um, but some did not, and I just used a jigsaw to cut them. I did make a couple of pieces where I went to a professional furniture maker and asked him to cut the guitars for me. Um, the saxophones were not cut. They were just dismantled from my assistant, whose name was Horn Doctor. <laughs> I learned that I, yeah, he's a horn doctor because he went to New Orleans during the uh, Katrina and fixed horns for free on the street. So he got the name Horn Doctor. But from him, I learned that you, 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 can, just, you can just melt the, um, the solder, just get a torch and put it right on the seam, and then you can take it apart. So... So that's how things come apart. How they go together is whatever it takes. But I try to make it as uh, invasive as possible. It has been an absolute honor to be in conversation with you. Oh, thank you. So thank I'm you. very thankful. Thankful to Daniel. I hope we made you proud. Congratulations on a wonderful exhibition. Can't wait for us to see it all and be in further community with each other. Yes, definitely. And there is another treat for us tonight. So, thank you. Thank you.